All right, let's uh, turn our attention now to more history of Artesia as we bring on Michael Redman from the Artesia Historical Museum and Art Center. Good morning. Good morning. Well, here we are, last couple days of the year. I can't believe we're almost at 2022. 20, and, uh, but it's going to be here, whether we uh, want it or not. <laughs> and uh, one of the things we've enjoyed doing here over the last few weeks is kind of talking about clothing trends for uh, folks in Artesia and across the country that uh, may have been around at one of the last turns of the century, late 1800s, early 1900s. And uh, let's, let's continue on with that theme. What would you like to talk about today in regards to clothing? Well, in terms of clothing trends, uh, something that I noticed uh, that's quite fascinating is how uh, this time, the time that, our, that uh, people started homesteading in the area, the 1880s, 1890s, mm -hmm. Uh, that's when there were significant uh, changes in uh, in materials and uh, and uh, clothing and fashion choices. But what's interesting about that is that it's a sort of a melting pot of different cultural clothing uh, being used uh, throughout the United States instead of uh, being you know limited uh, to specific areas or specific cultures. That's, that's, that's true and interesting because, like, today a lot of fashion trends are different influences. Um, a lot of it's marketing and advertising and, and other uh, influences on what people want to wear and, and, and buy. I'm assuming then from what you're going to tell us is at this time in the early 1900s, maybe technology and just what was available may have been as much of a factor as anything else. Oh, not so much. It was... Uh it was uh, a lot of it was international trade and colonialism. Okay. But another major factor is just that United, the United States, being a, a country built up from a lot of uh, immigrants from a lot of different parts of the world, people brought their own clothing uh, ideas, and as well, as you said, technology changes, as uh, as factories. Uh, became capable of manufacturing clothing in vast quantities, they were able to uh, incorporate different ideas and different, uh, different cultural uh, fashion trends into, wide, uh, and into nationwide clothing. Mm -hmm. like for example, the pullover sweater, just a simple knit sweater with uh, two sleeves and a, uh, and a now what what we would nowadays call a crew neck a crew neck mm -hmm. that was not widespread throughout uh, Europe or America before this point it was a very uh, a, a, it was a clothing item from cold and wet parts of the world mostly Scandinavia and Scotland and Ireland and you wouldn't see it in uh, to to any real extent in North America or in England before the uh, before the 1880s. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like I said, it was a cultural item for certain people, and they would just make their own sweaters, which the Scandinavians had done since uh, for for over a thousand years. Right. Just they just make them at home, but suddenly 1880s, they had machines that could uh, knit sweaters and they had elastic materials for cuffs and collars and waists and so something that was just associated with uh, mostly with uh, fishermen from Scandinavia became a clothing item that was available for everybody mostly mostly uh, working clothes but mm -hmm. it was uh, available for everybody yeah what are some other items that uh came from a culture or a part of the world that became more widespread around this time? Well, something that, uh, well, something that was uh, uh, very rare but known in Europe before this point, uh, the robe. The robe, okay. Yes. It was uh, something that, uh, that would be manufactured overseas and bought by wealthier people in uh, France and England 
But thanks to the Crimean War, various aspects of Turkish and uh, Asian culture uh, became a lot more well known in uh, in England and France because of all the veterans coming home. Mm -hmm. And so these items that were simply uh, not found uh, amongst uh, uh, regular people uh, soon became quite popular and there's a great demand for it. And in, thanks to the industrialization of uh, textiles, that became uh, popular items for people to buy. And are we talking like bathrobes? Are we talking yes. about that type of item? Okay. So Yes. Uh, that's uh, another uh, significant shift as well in clothing. Uh, as I hinted at last week, uh, people didn't wear the clothes that people wore indoors after uh, you know work was over was going to be different from what they wore outside, and that's one of the major things, bathrobes. Hmm. But there was a lot of variety, a lot of uh, different materials. Uh, uh, there were a lot of options that people had to, to make them or options for how they were made. But that did not really uh, exist as a common uh, material item that people had owned prior to the 1880s. Hmm. And, and again, as you said, uh, wealthier folks first, and then it became more affordable and more common across the country. And that was uh, thanks to uh, uh, cultural exchanges during a uh, during a war mm -hmm. in the 1850s. Yeah. Likewise, that's also how cigarettes became popular because they're popular in Turkey. Really, that's interesting. Uh, but but it makes sense. I don't think. I mean, tobacco. Did they did tobacco originate here, or was that brought over here by the Europeans? No, oh, it originated here, but it was brought over to uh actually i'm not i'm not 100 certain on that yeah because uh, it obviously grows here in certain parts of the country tobacco grows and is and is able to be cultivated and and converted but uh it probably wasn't used for the purpose that it was used it's used for now originally and somebody said hey <laughs> you can grow it roll it and smoke it <laughs> yeah I, I i cannot say for sure uh, i do believe that that was one of the uh one of the items brought over to europe on the columbian exchange because mm -hmm. i do know that for hundreds of years uh tobacco was a very popular item to be grown in turkey yes yes and, and part of uh, the reason why cigarettes became popular is because in turkey they preferred finely chopped up tobacco leaf. Mm -hmm. Whereas in uh, over in the United States, what they were selling and growing and selling were larger uh, leaf items that were like cigars and pipe tobacco or just even simple chewing tobacco. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, what are some of the other clothing um, trends where cultures... M meet and decide that's pretty cool I'd like to have that <laughs> well uh, coming from India um, during this time uh, cotton pants cotton but pants but fine or cotton pants okay like when we think of today as like uh, slacks chinos uh, uh, khakis items like that mm -hmm. lightweight cotton right that came out of India India, okay. Because the uh, popular cloth uh, for trousers uh, in Europe was wool. A much heavier cut of wool as well. Okay. As opposed and to the cotton. Opposed to the cotton, but also just a, a different, slightly different cut of uh, cloth. Mm hmm And it was far more comfortable to wear. And that led to, uh, between the... Uh, colonial exchanges and uh, British uh, military uh, uniform changes, it became quite popular starting uh, in the uh, 1890s for people to wear uh, khaki uh, trousers. Mm -hmm. Of course, that was also because the, the British uh, changed their uniform to a khaki-colored cloth, and they were the... Uh, 
the they were the most warlike of uh, European states at that point, so people were constantly reading about the khaki-clad uh, British soldiers in Africa and India uh, doing various things. So a lot but of this uh, worldwide exchange of items, from what you've described so far, really uh, go back to the to the British and the British Empire and their uh, reach around the world and how they brought it back and it uh, became a part of other cultures. That's that's a, f a very fair uh, uh, explanation, yes. And uh, in fact, something that we nowadays think of uh, as sort of frontier uh, homestead uh, a wagon train clothing, the calico dress, mm -hmm. that came from India. Okay. 1700s, uh, when during the first uh, you know, major trade exchanges between uh, England and India, they uh, they had in India this uh, very coarse uh, uh, cotton cloth that was kind of comfortable to wear, but the British mostly considered it to be uh, good for tablecloths and curtains. But it was a cotton that was dyed or are stamped in patterns. Okay. And so they, the British consider it to be de decorative clo decorative uh, household items, not as actual clothing items, until people started uh, using the, you know, the scraps and leftovers from previous unfashionable years and turned them into dresses. Mm-hmm. And found that they were quite comfortable instead of wearing uh, wool dresses. So that's, became popular amongst the uh, the more working class people. And then by the 1800s, that became a very popular in the United States, especially given how many people were traveling across the country in wagon trains. Uh, it was just very comfortable to wear out on the prairies, unlike uh, heavier wool dresses. Hmm. And so it makes its way across the West uh, on the wagon trains. But again, another item that traces its origins back to uh, to India. And India also gave us uh, pajamas. Well, I like pajamas. <laughs> I'm glad they did and, that. <laughs> although it's it's quite fascinating. Uh, prior to uh, prior to the 1880s, the common trend for uh, for uh, for men was to just wear their regular shirt at night because mm -hmm. shirts well, shirts uh, up to the uh, middle of the century were quite long. Okay. And they just wear their shirts at night. But starting uh, in the eight, well, really around the 1840s, shirts started getting shorter and shorter. And so the solution was to develop the night shirt, which was a very long shirt that was only worn at night. But after uh, a lot of the colonial exchanges between uh, England and India, they uh, discovered that you could wear uh, cotton pants and cotton shirts at night. Mm -hmm. And that led to the invention of the pajama suit. And that rapidly took over in the United States as uh, nighttime clothing for men. As opposed to the, to the night shirts? People preferred the uh, the pajamas over the night shirts, I guess. And by 1905, uh, they were still manufacturing night shirts, but they were very unpopular and mostly worn by older people. It was far more uh, fashionable for younger people to wear the latest in uh, cotton clothing trends. Okay. I it's guess when you say to... when, when you say the night shirt, all I, the, all that pops into my mind is Charles Dixon, Charles Dickens, and uh, the. Uh, uh, the, the the Christmas you know Scrooge Ebenezer Scrooge and all that some of the depictions of that character I guess would be considered wearing a nightshirt um, as opposed to pajamas or something like that I did I don't know why that just popped into my head when you were describing it and uh, well that's a perfect uh, explanation for for people who've never seen a nightshirt before it's just that it's a uh, it's that oversized uh, cotton or linen shirt with the collars and Maybe buttons or drawstring at the at the uh, collar and just going down to the knees or below. Or below, yeah. Okay.
I'm sorry, I, I, I interrupted you. You started to, to take us to another item there. I, I apologize. No, I was just going to say it's it's utterly fascinating to look at a, from a from modern perspective looking back, you have the cotton in question being used here in the United States is uh, American cotton that was domesticated by the Native Americans, not the... Uh, not Indian cotton. They weren't actually bringing over the cotton itself. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's a Native American cotton using Indian uh, patterns, but manufactured on American, uh, in, in American factories. It's, and it's being exported around the world huh. from those American factories. It's quite fascinating to consider. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Hey, we're uh, we're about out of time here. Is there anything else you'd like to add or mention what your your hours are for the New Year's Eve weekend? Well, we are going to be closed uh, New Year's Eve. Um, that's the, uh, the city uh, holiday. Okay. So my understanding is that most city buildings will be uh, closed. We will actually be open New Year's Day. Ah. Okay. So the, uh, it, it's, it's one of those funny things about how schedules work yeah so so your saturday hours are 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 10 to 1 and 2 to 4 okay so you'll and then be starting next week uh will be just uh open tuesday through saturday 10 to 1 and 2 to 4 but we will also be working on the uh on the annual uh, quilt show from the Artesia Quilters Guild. So ah, that will be okay. uh, ready uh, during the second week of January. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we'll talk more about that next week. How does that sound? That sounds great. All right. Michael, thank you.